Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today I will be talking to Dr. Jacqueline Lewis. Now, Jackie is an oncoplastic breast surgeon. Her background is actually in plastic surgery, but she also trained in oncological surgery, which means that she can use both of these areas of expertise to treat those affected by breast cancer, whilst at the same time ensuring a great aesthetic outcome. Jackie and I have known each other for some time now, and it was really great to catch up with her, especially during these difficult pandemic times. We talked about so many things, including the role of fat transfer, or what we also call lipomodeling in both breast cancer surgery as well as cosmetic surgery. We also talk about the various techniques that we can use and also who would most benefit from this kind of technique. You may also be wondering what part of the body would be the best donor site for taking fat from. So we also talk about that. And I would also urge you to listen right to the end because Jackie shares some of her tips and tricks for how best to improve the quality of the skin, not only for the breast, but also for other parts of the body. It was a great conversation and it was really fun as well. So without further ado, here is Dr. Jacqueline Lewis. Um, hi, Jackie. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. How are you today? Hi, Tash. It's a lovely day. Um, I'm looking out into my garden and the sun is shining. So yeah, really lovely day. Yeah, it's a shame that we are in lockdown, isn't it? Well, if it's going to help save lives, this is what we must do. That's true. So um, uh, you and I both live in the UK, and I, I know that there are listeners of this podcast around the world. So I actually would like just to say to uh, people who are listening outside of the UK that I hope you are staying safe. And also to those who are listening in the UK, um, this is the third week I think it's the last day of the third week of our lockdown. I'm not really sure if this is going to be extended. Uh, perhaps it will be. Perhaps it'll be um, lifted. I suspect it won't be lifted. But um, for, for everybody, I hope we, um, you're all well and you're all staying safe and healthy. Yeah, so Jackie Lewis, you, you and I have known each other for a while now. And I was just trying to figure out when, you know, when we first met, I was your trainee. And it was probably about a decade ago. Can you believe that? I think it might have been a little bit more than that as well. <laughs> oh my goodness, we are growing old. But I know. Pleasure having you on the team. Uh, uh, thank you. You, you know, you're, you're a fantastic tra um, trainer. And um, so, yes, yeah, so I was your trainee all those years ago. Then we became consultant colleagues. And we have, I guess, since moved our different ways. I really wanted you to come into the podcast to talk about an area that I know you are pas passionate about, and that is the role of fat transfer or lipo filling in, in breast surgery, breast cancer surgery. But before we start, would you mind telling us a little bit about what it is that you do? I, as you know, um, used to work at Charing Cross Hospital in the breast unit as an oncoplastic breast surgeon. And that's because of my plastic surgery background, because of my personal experience and my mother having had breast cancer when I was a final year trainee in plastic surgery, I developed an interest in breast surgery and because I wanted to give her all the options for reconstruction. I then went into breast surgery and trained for a further two to three years. Um, the final bit of my training was actually um, on the job at Charing Cross. And that's how I became an oncoplastic breast surgeon. So one of the things that we uh, we do in in breast surgery is, uh, and this definitely um, uses a technique that is borrowed from the plastic surgical world, and that is fat transfer or lipo filling. Can you describe to me what that actually entails? Lipo filling or fat transfer, also known as lipo modeling, it involves harvesting free fat from, say, the abdomen, the thighs, the flanks, so liposuction of any extra fat and then washing the fat, removing the excess blood and oil and then re-injecting those live fat cells into an area where it may be needed. So 
for breast surgery, it's possible to fill a wide local excision defect if you haven't been able to use the breast tissue or if there isn't very much breast tissue after a lumpectomy. You can use it for whole breast reconstruction. For example, the remaining fatty tissue underneath the skin over an implant type reconstruction is thin and you can see the edge of the implant or rippling. Having a bit of fat in between the skin and the implant will mask the implant, so it's very useful in that respect. Also, to touch up volume or contour defects after the use of a flap after recon for reconstruction is very useful too. The major limiting thing is the amount of fat that can be harvested if someone is thin. And the other limitation is that you can only inject as much fat as you feel will be in contact with live tissue where you're going to inject it. So if you have very thin, say for example, you've done a reconstruction of a breast with an implant and you've got very thin skin over the surface of the implant and there's a lot of rippling. In order to be able to mask that implant, you're going to have to have enough fat. And so the more fat you have, the thicker the fatty layer, the more it will mask the implant. But when you first do the fat injections, you need to inject little, little bits. So we normally inject little packets of fat or linguine type um, strands underneath the skin right. to ensure that each of those fat globules is in contact with live tissue. Because in order for the fat to survive, it will need to be in contact with live tissue to take up a blood supply. So at each operation or each injection, you can only inject a little bit. And you need to normally do several injections um, with a minimum of 8 to 12 weeks in between each injection because a portion of the fat you inject will not survive and that will be um, taken up by the body and got, gotten rid of. If you make the mistake of injecting too much fat into an area, that fat will necrose or die and you'll get a fat cyst and eventually you could get calcifications because, you know, the reason why fat transfer got a bad reputation about 20 years ago is because surgeons were injecting too much fat into an area. Right. Fat was dying and there'd be lumps and fat cysts, calcifications in the breast. And the radiologists, um, the people who read mammograms, weren't so experienced in those days of um, being able to gauge between fat necrosis from fat transfer versus microcalcifications that can sometimes be associated with early breast cancer. Right. More experienced now, the radiologists are better able to make that distinction. Right. So it's accepted now that it's quite safe. You know, as, as a technique, it is qu a quite a specialized technique and probably not many people know it exists. So, you know, if somebody has had, for example, breast conservation surgery, so a lumpectomy, and we do try to mobilize, as you said, the breast tissue to cover that defect, but then they might have had radiotherapy as well. And so the contour of the breast may not have been maintained adequately. And if you have, you know, a, a marked defect within the breast, then um, one of the ways that we can do to mitigate that or to help that is by doing some lipomodeling and fat transfer. So if somebody like that came to you, what clinical examination would you do to, uh, to assess the suitability of somebody for lipofilling? It would really um, depend on how they looked and what they wanted to achieve. And of course, we'd need to make sure that they were cancer free. Yes, that's very so important, isn't it? So um, they'd need to have their usual clinical check, their mammogram, and possibly an ultrasound scan. And there's a move towards not uh, offering fat transfer to um, 
BRCA gene carriers or someone who has a risk of family history right. tested. Okay. Because, um, and then also if they have other risk factors that might predispose them to a recurrent breast cancer. Right. So you'd need to make sure that they knew that they'd need multiple injections, usually two or three, depending on the size or the amount of fat they'd need to have transferred into the breast, so the defect side, Mm -hmm. and whether or not they had enough fat to harvest. And they'd also need to take into consideration that sometimes where you liposuction the fat from, you can end up with loose skin and or contour irregularities in the donor area. So I suppose, you know, you want to try and minimize the number of operations you do, but to make sure that you don't take too much fat away because it's a precious commodity, especially in a thin person. And you want to gauge how much fat you can actually inject each time because if you inject too much, you're going to waste the fat, it's going to die. And you have to balance that against using that episode, that general anesthetic, that hospital episode to its maximum so that you don't waste it. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, so it's, it's quite a balance, quite isn't experience. it? Yeah, you need to be quite experienced. Do you remember when we used to harvest the fat? Yes. In those days, we used to use what we call the Coleman technique, where we'd harvest it and then put it into um, tubes and centrifuge it. And then yeah. You'd need to take away the oil and the um, blood. <laughs> yeah, those were the days. <laughs> all over the place. I used to Stop. remember my, um, my poor thumb getting quite arthritic because we had to, it's, quite, it's quite hard work actually harvesting fat, isn't it? Nowadays, I use a um, power-assisted lipo suction machine um, and the continuous suction rather than the syringe because <laughs> okay, the that syringe makes sense. Your poor thumb. And also, um, I rarely use the centrifuge um, technique anymore because it takes such a long time and you can only process little um, volumes of fat. So yeah. I use a washing technique. That's right. So I think we started with the Coleman technique. Then we went on to the uh, bag, what? you know, the filtration yeah, bag. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and but... now, and, and now there's um, another system. It's like a plastic bucket with um, tubes that you can um, put in the fat. And so it's a lot quicker now, and it's a closed system. So yeah, much more. So it's much. Now. It's more efficient. It. Because I think the other the other thing that people do say is, oh, you know, you, you can just take fat from anywhere, and you know, I've got lots of fat for you to harvest. But actually, there is good fat, and then there is bad fat. Yes and no. You know, there have been lots of studies compare methods of extraction of fat, methods of processing, and then how to inject it. And basically, as long as you use the closed system, you don't leave the fat around for too long and you inject it into small, in small amounts so that it's in contact with live tissue. There doesn't seem to be so much of a difference between good and bad fat. Okay, that's good. Hmm, what I have found, though, is that people who are probably overweight, their fat cells are probably larger than people who are not overweight, you feel that you're going to lose more fat and that there's going to be more oil. But I'm not sure that the amount of fat that survives is so different. Okay. Here's the interesting thing. For women who don't have very much fat, I used to say, oh, go and if you put on weight, it might make it easier for me to inject the fat. But in fact, the cells will just be bigger and so you won't have more fat to inject. In my reading, when I was doing my master's dissertation on um, fat transfer and whether it is safe, there's a paper by Chukalova. Here's the thing. So if you give, if you overfeed people of a normal weight, say for about six weeks before you harvest the fat, especially in women, the 
fat above the waist, the fat cells will increase in size. But below the waist, say around the thighs and um, saddlebag areas, you'll actually have hyperplasia of those fat cells, which means that you'll actually develop more fat cells in those areas. And so now I'm saying, yes, do. If you don't have enough um, to start off with, do try and overeat for at least six weeks before the <laughs> operation. Right. Or harvest the fat from wherever we can get it. And the nice thing is that there'll be more increased number of fat cells okay. in your thighs. Yeah. All those, transfer them. And then when you go back to your normal weight, you'll be thin again. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it is worthwhile um, overeating is if you're thin. <laughs> Um, in order to make more fat cells in that fat factory beneath your waist. So that's a, that's a good excuse to, get, to, go off, to go off your diet then, is it? <laughs> well, you know, there are some women who are so thin anyway that they say, oh, no matter what I eat, I won't put on fat. But I say, but do try. <laughs> I don't know if you remember the case, um, uh, the lady who lost half of her breast from um, failed Dieppe flap. For yes. Yes. And she had loads of fat and I just liposuctioned various areas and we were able to give her um, a decent looking normal breast to match the other side, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Yeah, no, that's true. Why not, you know? No, absolutely. Have have fat where you really want it. (laughs) Yeah, no, definitely. It's really interesting because when I, you know, when I, when I talk about this in the clinic, sometimes um, their partners will say, oh, you know, I, I'll donate some of my fat. <laughs> can can no, use some of my fat? No, that's not possible. <laughs> that's not possible. Autologous. No, yeah. that's unfortunately not possible. But um, are there better areas to harvest fat from, you know, from the body? Is your abdomen, your tummy better than your thighs that are better than your buttocks, for example? Mm, not necessarily. Right. There, there hasn't really been any studies to show that one area is better than the other. Where would you prefer to harvest fat if if you were doing it? Or, no- you, or you don't have a preference, really? I normally give the option of um, the abdomen, the thighs, or the flanks. And just from volume, a lot of women have more on their thighs rather than anywhere else. But it really depends on each individual woman. Uh, on the face of it, it sounds pretty simple, but actually it's a pretty complicated, highly nuanced technique? It is. You know, one of the things that I have been offering, and I'm still waiting to see what the long-term results are, is the use of the fat bank, where for someone who you know needs to have many, many injections, because you can only inject a little bit into the area that um, you're going to inject in, and you know that in order to build up that volume you're going to need several injections if they have a decent amount of fat that you can liposuction in one go i harvest as much fat as i can under that one general anesthetic i inject some of the fat as much as i can get into the area that needs to be augmented and i send the rest of the fat off to the regenerous fat bank in sheffield okay where it is frozen And at regular intervals on dates set by myself and the patient, I can ask the fat bank to defrost however much I want, and they're stored in aliquots of 30 cc's of fat. So say, for example, I was able to inject 120 cc's of fat into um, a mastectin flap, and I wanted to build it up. So the second time round, I can probably inject a little bit more. So we wait 12 weeks and then I ask the fat bank to um, defrost about 150 or 160 cc's and the patient comes in and under a local anesthetic and or sedation, I can do the injection. And with that technique, that patient doesn't have to have multiple general anesthetics and have to go through the recovery from the liposuction because oftentimes my patients have said that it's the recovery from the liposuction that's difficult because they're bruised to wear a compression garment for three weeks, that's day and night. 
there is um, the suture removal a week after the operation. It's it's painful. Yes, it's uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. That, that's a really fantastic and efficient way of working. Yes, out of the um, 10 ladies who have had it, yeah. um, I'm still waiting to see what the long-term outcome is. I have a feeling it's those women who had more fat that I could harness have got better outcomes and that the um, thin women who I didn't inject that much or I wasn't able to inject that much fat into, they have got modest outcomes. Okay. Well, it'd be interesting yeah. to see the outcome when you get them and you can, you know, you can compare and contrast, can't you? So here's the thing. I'm not sure that um, a lot of people will use the fat bank because a lot of surgeons will inject fat directly into the breast for cosmetic cases. And I don't do that because there's this discrepancy with what happens in the lab and clinically. Um, We talked about this before, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Because during the early days of lipofilling or lipo fat transfer, there was a concern that was raised that potentially this could cause a problem within the breast and cause cancer cells to to regenerate and um, increase the risk of a cancer recurrence within that breast. This is, of course, in cancer patients. But um, we were talking about this off air. That, that There have been a few landmark papers around this area, hasn't there? Yeah, so Tash, here's the thing. In the lab, when researchers use cancer cell lines in a test tube and inject fat-derived stem cells, the cancer cells go crazy and divide like mad. In a fat graft, you've got mature adipocytes or fat cells, as well as stem cells. And it's the stem cells within the fat that keeps that family of adipocytes alive in the long term. If you have an unknown abnormal cell in your breast, and I'm talking about injecting fat into the breast for cosmetic cases, um, how do you know that that fat graph won't stimulate a breast cancer to work. There have been several papers to show that there is no increased risk of breast cancer when you inject fat into the breast. And this is in cancer patients or non-cancer patients? So in non-cancer patients, there have been surgeons who inject fat into the breast for augmentation, and there's been to, I suppose, 10 or 20 years follow-up now, no increased risk of breast cancer. There was one paper by Johnny Petit in Italy who injected fat for reconstruction after wide local excision for ductal carcinoma in situ cases. So that's non-invasive breast cancer. So those who've had a lumpectomy for DCIS, non-invasive DCIS, and also... He had a cohort of women who were treated for invasive breast cancer. So those were the study group. And then there was a matched control group where these women didn't have fat transfer. And he followed them up. And here's the thing. In the shorter term follow-up, there was an increased risk of local recurrence in the women who had fat transfer who had had DCIS. And that was scary. Yeah. But subsequently, on longer follow-up and with a greater number of patients, and I think he amalgamated um, his case series with um, a French group of patients, on longer follow-up, the risk of local recurrence in the cohort of match controls who didn't have fat transfer had as greater number of local recurrences as the fat-treated group. So we think it's safe, but here's the thing. Women now are living to such a long, you know, great age. We're expected to live into our hundreds now. And if you have fat injected when you're 30, that's 70 years of, you know... Of living. And (laughs) fat in your (laughs) breast and stem cells... Um, releasing these growth factors. 
we know that the two greatest risk factors for breast cancer are number one, being female, number two, growing old. Yeah. You know, 80% of all breast cancers are going to be diagnosed over the age of 50 with increasing incidence the older you get. It won't be for several decades until we find out if fat injection in the breast will actually be safe or not, might be protective. It might actually be a stimulus for breast cancer. Who knows, Tash? Mm. So that's why for cosmetic cases anyway, I will only inject fat beneath the skin of the breast and behind the breast gland where, you know, the breast is a gland uh, in the skin. And so there's a plane of normal fat in front and behind the breast. But some of my colleagues will inject fat into the breast next to the breast glandular tissue. And here's the thing. If someone has got abnormal cells in their breast, who knows what those growth factors will do? Will those fat cells be protective? Will those stem cells releasing the growth factors excite those abnormal cells to grow and become cancerous? I don't know. Um, As you said, when we do lipomodeling or fat transfer, it is done quite superficially, isn't it? So you don't really inject it within the breast tissue as such. Um, I will inject fat into the breast for breast cancer reconstruction cases. But I know that those women will be getting a mammogram and or ultrasound and or MRI every year, and that I'm going to follow them up clinically every year, but not for those cosmetic cases. You are quite cautious in doing this in cosmetic cases, whereas for breast cancer cases, breast reconstruction cases, we, you know, we, we feel that there is no evidence of an increased risk and we, we deem it safe. But you also know that we are we are going to be following these patients up so that there is that additional security, if you like. Uh, you also uh, alluded earlier that one of the uses of, of this technique is to minimize rippling when, you know, people have had breast implant surgery in the context of uh, breast reconstruction for cancer. Um, So, yeah, Tash, not just for reconstruction, because a lot of women now, especially the thin women who want implants, and you know the way there's been a move away from using textured implants. Um, You can't use anatomical implants if you don't want the texturization, and that's because of the risk of BIALCL, breast yeah, so be breast implant associated ALCL. And plastic cell syndrome, yeah. Um, so women now are moving towards having round implants. And with round implants, sometimes they tend to ripple more. Right. So there's a move now towards using smaller implants and with having more fat cover. Okay. So so you're doing that in the um, cosmetic arena as well as for uh, breast cancer reconstruction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because traditionally we would be, f- for breast cancer reconstruction surgery, so for those who've had a mastectomy and they want to have a breast reconstruction um, in the, say, implant setting, traditionally we would be putting the implant underneath pectoralis major muscle. So that's your the your chest wall muscle. The pectoralis major muscle is lifted off um, your chest wall, uh, the implant is placed underneath that. and um, But now there is a move now to be placing the implant on top of the pectoralis major muscle. So that minimizes the need for lifting that muscle off the chest wall, which is good because it becomes a less invasive procedure. And then we will put that implant, you know, within a thin mesh um, or what's called an acellular dermal matrix, um, which is a thin material that's either made from cow skin or pig skin. And then the skin of, of the breast is then overlying that. But one of the risks of this particular procedure is rippling of the implant. So fat transfer has played or is playing a part in trying to minimize that right now. Yes, you're absolutely right, Tash. The ultimate Cosmetic outcome depends entirely on how much soft tissue you have between the implant and the skin. Life is so unfair. For those thin people who don't have very much tissue, if you're going to do a mastectomy, you have even less tissue. So you need to have 
some fat underneath the skin to mask the implant edge and the rippling. And not just for reconstruction. You know, the, the um, argument between using implants for cosmesis in front and behind the pectoralis muscle. I mean, the main reason that people put the implant behind the muscle is just to get that extra bit of soft tissue to hide yes. the edge and so mm. the implant. Even in cosmetic cases, if the implant is put behind the pectoralis muscle, a lot of the time the lower part of the breast isn't covered by the pectoralis muscle because it just doesn't go that far down. That's right. So fat transfer is an option to put underneath the skin and to mask the um, surface and edge of the implant, not just for the reconstruction cases, but also for the cosmetic cases. But you're right, with this move now towards using what we call pre-pectoral reconstruction, um, especially now with with the use of synthetic meshes that, that are even thinner than the um, porcine or bovine ADMs, that's the pig or cow ones, um, there's practically no tissue between the skin and the implant. And so I think a lot of women will be unhappy with the surface irregularities and the visibility of the um, edges of the implant. And yeah, fat transfer may be the answer. Yeah, because I think that is one of the the, the main things amongst others, but to, to warn women about the visibility of the rippling of the implant. And usually if you're slim and you want a form of reconstruction, the fact that you are slim really excludes any form of, say, for example, a Dieppe reconstruction because, you, you know, because you're slim, you probably won't have enough tissue in your, in your tummy area. And so your, your best option would be an implant. But then because you're slim, you don't have, as you said, much tissue. So it, it, uh, it's not ideal, really, is it? And it can be quite a, a difficult and challenging problem to, to rectify. You're absolutely right. The, the most difficult breast reconstructions are in those thin women who have relatively large breasts because they've got glandular tissue. And it's hard to reconstruct people who don't have very much tissue. Because if you think of what we used to do, the latissimus dorsi flap, the flap from the back, you're taking away one of the largest muscles on the back. And even then, there's not very much tissue there. And it used to be standard to put that over an implant as well. So you have the yeah. worst of both worlds. You know, That's right, yeah. Possible unwanted effects of the implant, which only last 10 to 15 years anyway, plus the scar on the back and the recovery. Um, and then the move towards just using an implant and, inadequate soft tissue cover and a lot of those women don't actually have enough tissue on their lower abdomen or their upper thighs or even their buttocks to um, have um, a free flap so yeah it's really really challenging yeah it is really challenging and um, it just goes to show how the reconstruction um, techniques and patient selection is so so important and that takes a lot of a lot of knowledge and a lot of expertise to decide what best reconstruction is suitable for a particular patient. Mm, and also sometimes no reconstruction for those who don't want to undergo complex surgery sometimes. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think reconstruction um, has its risks attached to, to that. If you don't want a reconstruction, that, then that's absolutely fine too. You can go flat and have a simple mastectomy and that's also absolutely fine. It's all up to each individual patient, isn't it? Yeah. So we've talked about surgical techniques that we can do to improve the appearance of people's breasts. Are there any non-surgical treatment options that we can use to do that? Well, you know, a lot of women, after they've had their breast mound reconstructed, and they come to me and they say, oh, but look at all this loose and crepey skin on my decollete area. In my um, dissertation, I learned about the use of manifat which is really great for the skin. So um, once you've um, processed the fat and washed away the um, blood and the oil, if you pass the fat through small channels or a sieve, you can actually break up the fat and get rid of all the 
excess stuff around it and you can get this sort of emulsified um, liquid. Okay. If you do very superficial injections into the dermis of nanofat, you can actually improve the skin. If you take that a step further, and this is probably a few years down the line, mm -hmm. you can extract exosomes from fat cells and inject that into the skin, or even use a microneedling technique and improve the skin that way. So, you know the way as you grow older, you lose a lot of the collagen and elastin in your skin. Yes. And after the age of 25, your own production of collagen and elastin <laughs> starts to decrease. It's, wow. it's sad. So, That's very sad. That's very young. <laughs> 25. You, you will start getting wrinkles, <laughs> not on your, on your face, but your boobs will, will droop. Oh, dear. The, the larger they are, the more they'll droop because of gravity and weight. Yeah, um, we can't defy gravity, unfortunately, yeah. can we? You can actually just improve your skin texture by um, introducing either nanofat or microneedling it. So if you use a um, microneedling techniques and, and rub in the um, nanofat solution. But also you can boost your collagen and elastin production and improve the quality of your skin everywhere in your body, not just your face, by using oral collagen supplements. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so that actually works? Yeah, definitely. I, I swear by it. I've been taking it for some months. <laughs> well, Jackie, you have no wrinkles at all. So oh, yeah. You know, that's the works. Botox. <laughs> Oh, yeah. and, you know, if, um, you, if you want to find out about Botox, come over. There you go. <laughs> In that <for> decades <laughs> as well. <laughs> um, radio frequency is really good as well. Okay. What um, does, how does that work? So radio frequency tightens the skin. And um, I use, well, I um, advise a lot of my patients, especially on the liposuction donor areas, if they have, um, loose or regular skin after liposuction to have radiofrequency treatment. Okay. And um, certainly the oral collagen supplements will not only, only improve the quality of your skin all over your body, but um, your skin, your hair, your nails will improve as well. Oh, so did you say oral? So you take it, it's yeah. a tablet form? Um, it's a liquid normally. So I okay. improve taking oral collagen supplements until I read um, a study where in the lab, and it was an animal study, so they gave oral uh, collagen, labeled uh, collagen substances, uh, or this to, to animals. Um, in yeah. the control group, um, they didn't have collagen. And in the study group where they had the labeled collagen, after I think it was 8 to 12 weeks, um, and they took histological specimens of both uh, groups of the skin, they actually found the labeled collagen in the study group, and there was a significantly higher proportion of collagen and elastin in the skin, and the skin looked younger. So that's why I take it every day. Wow. Okay. M must, get, <laughs> must get the name from me soon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Jackie, thank you so much. For people who want to find you, where should they go? I have got a website. It's drjacquelinelewis.com. And I am also on Facebook and Instagram at Dr. Jacqueline Lewis. At Dr. Jacqueline Lewis. Yeah. Okay, so I will leave all of those links in the show notes. So for people who want to connect with you and visit your website, then they can do that for sure. Um, Jackie, thank you so much once again for coming onto the podcast. I hope you stay well and hope at some point we can meet up and oh, that have another be, catch up in person. That would be lovely, Tash. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Jackie. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much once again to Dr. Jacqueline Lewis for coming onto the podcast and for sharing her expertise. That was such great fun. So do check her website at www dr jacqueline lewis.com so that's d-r-j-a-c-q-u-e-l-i-n-e lewis.com and you can also follow her on instagram and facebook with the same handle 
And I will leave all of these links in the show notes at mybreastmyhealth.com forward slash episode 17. If you haven't done so already, do subscribe to the show because by doing so, all of the new upcoming episodes will be downloaded straight to your podcasting app of choice so you don't miss an episode.